Welcome to the Bedrock Way Podcast, where we're changing the habits of yesterday by creating the new healthcare reality of tomorrow. And Jonathan, am I excited today? I'm excited today because we have a very special guest. Episode 11, 12, 13. I don't even know what this is. Today's episode is Beyond the Towers, a story from a 9-11 survivor. Lou, welcome to the Bedrock Way Podcast. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. But I want to hear from you what your life was on September 10th. I think a lot of us focus on what happened on September 11th. And again, it's well chronicled. If you guys want to hear Lou's story, um, we'll we'll definitely link it out when we put out the podcast. And it's well documented. He's been on TV shows. He's been on several platforms advocating Again, dealing with his own PTSD, dealing with the experience, but wanted to share his story, his story of resilience, the story where, you know, God has a plan for Lou, and Lou is realizing that plan. September 11th was the day that our nation lost its innocence, you know, and, 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 and a lot <laughs> of us, unfortunately, became victims of just the cynicism that has followed. But let's talk about you as an individual, because I think the biggest value to this podcast is the unbelievable story of resilience. And again, we go back to that courage, that valor, right? The moments of weakness that only erupt more strength. So tell me how your life was on September 10th of 2001. Uh, I was a guy, I stayed in his lane, routine, you know, uh, get up, go to work, uh, raise my boys, um, come home, do the sports with them, uh, things that you know you grew up that your parents did, and you're following their footsteps, and you kind of just you go about your life, uh, just um, systematically. You just wake up. Here's what I do today. Come home, and you don't think really twice about it. Um, looking back on that prior, you know, growing up in a house full of uh, six kids, five sisters, one bathroom. I always tell people feel bad for me. Um, it was a rough life there. <laughs> But, uh, you know, looking back on those days, it was just a normal, you know, family growing up and uh, whatnot. And then leading up to 9-11, it just, you know, I never put myself out there. Uh, just always stayed in background. Um, I am an outgoing person, but just at a certain point, like I keep it like a line, like, all right, don't go too far there. Just you, you've said enough, just back off, you know, let someone else do it. Um, that's how I was prior to it. Um, so for you, it was more of you were, again, with five sisters, <laughs> I'm sure, uh, that you had to, you know, um, play your play your uh, your cards correctly yes. uh, because you were certainly outnumbered. Uh, so, again, you followed more of a robotic mentality, right? So you n- not needing to be the center of attention. And it seemed like and again, you were raising two very strong young men as well. We talked about that earlier as we were in our <laughs> rock green room. Um, so how did your life change at on September 12th? And then let's caveat that to how it made you who you are today. Well, September 12th was my youngest son's birthday and waking up, um, to be able to celebrate that was, I think the first, um, Take your time, man. Take your time. Was, uh, you know, waking up going, wow, like, you know, you got a purpose. Um, you got two little guys that are dependent on you. And uh, it, you know, leading up to, you know, they depend on you. You're the father, you know, you're working, mom's working, you do your things. But uh, it was... Um, I chose not to let this run my life. And when I was going to therapy, the person, she was wonderful. Her name was Teresa Benswig. And uh, she was an older lady, very eccentric. And uh, so I think about the second or third session, we were talking about it. And we were talking about my PTSD. And she goes, uh, how you handle it? And I go, I embrace it. She, looked, she goes, what did you just say? I go, I embrace it. And I said, uh, I'm not going to let it control my life. And I watched her put down, she stopped taking notes at that point. She put down her clipboard and she was, Lou, I'm going to be honest with you. I've uh, dealt with about 200 patients that have PTSD and no one's ever told me that before. And I said, well, I got, again, center around my, center, centers around my two sons. I got, I got two little guys at home that depend on me. 
And yeah, is it going to affect me? Absolutely. Am I going to have my moments? Absolutely. But it's not going to run my life to where I can't be there for them. Not trying to be a hero. Not trying to be this great guy. But inside me, it just hit me that, you know, you're not going to let it control your life. And it, and it hasn't. You know, I said to you earlier, you know, weeks leading up, I told my my wife, I got remarried a couple of years ago, that when we first met that, I told her weeks leading up to it, I get emotional and it subsides weeks afterwards. And I go through my periods during the year, but it's this time where it really happens the most. And she was just, she's been wonderful with it. But um, yeah, and, that, and that's how I dealt with it. Um, and just found that strength to, to do it, you know, and just, uh, and I see them now and thank God every day that I'm here to see them grow. Um, I have a grandson, uh, he's three and a half. I have a granddaughter on the way in December and uh, it's just an amazing life right now. So um, that, that, listen, that, that life and that family is I think a token of your inner strength. Let's get back to God's plan. And we talked about this, right? And, and, and we've talked about this in previous podcasts where, you know, the most important day of our life is not really when we're born, but the day that we find out why. And before 9-11, you were living to your point a very robotic life. It was routine. You used that word routine, where sometimes the miraculous aspect of just being alive is taken for granted. And it's almost, yeah. the, almost the American way, right? The American way is fast, fast, fast. And you're working in Manhattan, you're working at World Trade Center, probably the most chaotic place in the planet, on the planet. And you're dealing with people who probably don't appreciate the existence and the miraculous existence of their very self. Mm -hmm. And not only themselves, but they de definitely don't appreciate the existence <laughs> of their family members. And I'm going to get to a point that I want to make a point. On 9-12, actually, that changed. Right? On 9-12, you realize the meaning of life wasn't trying to make the mighty dollar. It wasn't trying to get ahead. It was realizing that the reason you were put on this earth was to raise two young men. Yeah. Right? It was to yep. raise two young men, make them who they are today. And you just mentioned they're two successful union electricians. Uh, listen, that's a, <laughs> I would recommend that to anybody uh, nowadays. Agreed. I just had one in my house <laughs> the other day. And... Um, uh, very well trained and a, and a big necessity that we'll have, I think, perpetuity uh, need. But that's what I really want you to, <clears throat> to tell my listeners, Lou, because I think that purpose, that purpose that sometimes it, it escapes a lot of us, which where we don't understand why we were put on this earth. I have three children, and I 100% agree with you. They are my biggest inspiration. They're my biggest heroes. They're the ones that I look up to. And, and it's a perfect version of yourselves. But I want you to tell me how that experience on 9-11 changed the way you parented, changed the way you looked at your family. Because the man I see now 22 years later is almost like 9-11 was something that did good for you. As, as crazy as that sounds, it was something that in your life needed to happen at that point in time and it galvanized something inside you that at that point in time wasn't living. Because living in a, as a, in a robotic environment is not living. That's just existing. Right. But when you learn to live is when you learn to appreciate every amazing thing about our life. So let's talk about that because I want to get into the plan. And I want to get into what you have done since to realize that purpose to its maximum potential. Well... Speaking of my boys, uh, like I said prior, it was raising them, get up, go to school, go to sports, do this. They were bad, you know, discipline them, and your day's over, you know, whatever. And it was just getting routine. When I look back on it right now, in my head right now, it's amazing how routine that was. Afterwards, I'm not going to tell you it, it happened. And one thing I tell people, too, and um, that when this happened, you know, I say I almost lost my life, it, you know, in 10 minutes, and I put time in and then before the plane hit our building, and it was 25 minutes that it fell when I got out. So I look back on that, that perspective. And I tell people, I didn't run out and go, I'm going to do this now because, uh, you know, I always want to do this. And I think people get wrapped up in that when they have a, a trauma experience happen to them and they think they have to go out and do little things in their lives. Like, no, put the brakes on. Almost like stop and go, all right, what's important to me? What I like, it's almost like resetting yourself. 
And thinking about actually right now sitting here, I think I reset myself with my sons because I was raised in a very strict household with my dad. We feared him, right? And he, you know, you know, you got the belt if you were bad, and you know, it was tough love growing up, you know. Um, with my sons, past that, it was more of talking to them if they did something wrong. Um, and I'll give you an example. Uh, I got a compliment one time at a party where my son, my older son was bad. <laughs> and I kind of always, my thing was always under the armpit, kind of just led them away. And I would go talk to him outside the park because I believe that if you yell at a kid in front of people, you're embarrassing them. And I just started doing that. I took him away from the party. It was a family party, big party. Talked to him. And I always said, now, you know, do you understand why I'm talking to you? And we got it out and we went back in. Now, and I would tell him, now go have a good time. Not to be noticed to me, my dad's wife would see this. And years later, she goes, you know, one thing I always admired of you, that when I, if your kids acted out, you never disciplined them in front of people, where my dad would do that, you know, in, in uh, that old school, didn't care, I'm going to discipline them now. But I would take them away from the situation. No one taught me that, I just did that on my own. And I look back on that, I think a lot of it was just understanding more about them and what how it makes them tick. I, I talked to them differently, like I talked, to my employees, everybody's got different personalities, which I believe is one of my strengths, how I can handle people. And um, I said prior to this is my youngest son, at one point, he didn't know what he wanted to do. And he, him and I had a long talk and I never, I never got that from my dad. You know, it was more of just go to college, do your thing and uh, you know, that was it. And any accomplishment I did, he never connected with, he was a blue collar, I was white collar. So I tried to tell my accomplishments, he would just look right through him and go, oh, that's, yeah, it's good, nothing from him. Now with my sons, I kind of use that as their electrician. I don't know anything about electricity. I can maybe change an outlet and I can put a fan in. But those guys, when they show me what they do, and my oldest, he's probably sending me pictures. Dad, look what I just did today. You know, I'm gonna, that, and I make sure I tell them that is awesome. Tell me about your day. And I always ask them, like when I talk to them, you know, how's work going and all that. And I never got that from my dad. Um, so it, it's now, it's understanding them more. I backed off to being the tough guy, discipline guy, more of the loving discipline, but they still know I can be tough when I have to be, you know? And uh, that's pretty much with them, how I, I live with them, you know, up to this day now, you know, just always there for them. And I try to talk to them and hopefully it does some good. In, in, incredible. And you mentioned something that's so alive and unfortunately well right now. And that's the acronym that we all know as YOLO. Right. You only live once. So you're right. Sometimes people who go through these experiences as you went through 9-11, they would be susceptible to YOLO. Right. And say, I defied the odds. Now I'm going to take advantage of every ounce that I have. And unfortunately, that's when you start seeing things that unfortunately become, you know, their detriment. Y yesterday, we had a guest on the podcast that talked about adverse childhood experiences. And adverse childhood experiences are basically what happens to you in your youth and how those experiences become the foundation for your life. And those adverse childhood experiences, though, affect your mental health. They actually precipitate chronic disease. They lead people into substance abuse. They unfortunately reduce your life expectancy. They affect your immunity. They affect your cognitive function. They affect your social economic factors. Again, what we do with our children, good or bad, will affect them the rest of their life. And just hearing you say how 9-11 changed the way you were a parent, you know, and, and the foundation of their life. And unfortunately, these adverse childhood experiences are inherited. They're passed down. And they rewired the genetic expression of generations. It's passed on. You made a decision, actually, to stop that. You made a decision to deviate from what you was passed on to you and provide your kids a different experience, a different opportunity to succeed. And I think that's why you're happier, and that's why they're happier. And again, that becomes a way of you platforming trauma as a way to enhance your life rather than detract your life. Correct. I, I wanted to ask something that's been in my head quite a bit. <clears throat> I know um, I, as I read your story, you mentioned how sometimes as you were watching an action movie or as you were watching 
potentially something that would take you back to that uh, event. Um, you would all it would almost put you back into that event. Is that still something that happens, or is that something that kind of just wore off as time went on? It was uh, actually only a, a, this is a one and done thing, and uh, you know we hear that we only use ten percent of our brains, and I've always wanted to know what those people went through that day. And I was watching, you know, a sci-fi movie. And as I'm watching it, my left leg started sh tapping, like shaking. And it never does that. I'm like, I'm like what is, what's going on right now? And I looked at the TV and the people running, it was on a spaceship. They all of a sudden were in uh, casual business wear. Women were wearing dresses. Guys had, I remember one had a suit on, one had just a button down shirt and a polo on and running. And the, the Nicene desk on there. And I'm watching this, and I kind of put my head down, looked, I go, what are you looking at right now? And it happened for like several seconds and it kind of just went back into what it was. And I look back on that and I really think, I believe this, whether I'm wrong or right, is that my brain said, okay, you want to see this, I'm giving you one shot to look at this and that's it. And I think somehow it tapped into it and I saw what those people went through for those several seconds when they were running from the flames and it, uh, Never happened again since then, um, but it I'll never forget it. You know? And the reason I wanted you to say that is because you, you mentioned a couple of things. And you mentioned that trauma is something that potentially was trying to create your world, right? And the self-talk, you said to yourself, because the mind is very powerful. And that's what I want to get to. The mind is very powerful. That day you said to yourself, this is not going to define my life, and I'm going to take this out of my head and uh, when I read your story that that got to me because those instances when people continue to relive their their trauma relive a lot of that mental health detriment it leads people to unfortunately something that we call suicide and there has been a massive 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 um, mental health deterioration from survivors of 9-11 and one thing that I did the other day was research on, you know, what has led um, people to down these paths. But I'm more interested in what has been the support for you guys from either, I don't know if there are resources, but is anyone reaching out to you consistently to say, hey, Lou, it's been 22 years, you know, what else, you know, how are you doing now? What can we do to support you? What can we do? For you to be a better citizen again either from your employer back then from any state program i'm just curious about what is being done to make sure that you continue to live your life and again you're doing an amazing job because you, you present yourself incredibly well but i'm just curious about people who are not like lou people who don't have your your, your you know the, the the foundation that you have people who don't have two incredible children an incredible wife an incredible support system because again we learn to get out of these traumas by the community that supports us. Who else is reaching out to these people? Uh, well, the uh, World Trade Center Health Organization, you get a survey once a year to see how you're doing. Um, you register with them. Um, you know, when I first, this when this first happened, I had uh, benefits from them. So, you know, they paid for the, the therapist, so that helped in the beginning. Um, you know, since then, uh, you know, what I'm going through now, I'm part of the, uh, the sort of, um, this is a drug bill. If I, sorry, if I chop that name up, but um, I was, I got uh, prostate cancer uh, back in 020. I was diagnosed with it, and that was one of the recognized illnesses. So um, you know, I'm going through that part of it, and um, but it's uh, just run into a little issue with that. And it's kind of funny you say that because you know we're going through this. I did everything I was supposed to do. You know, with the. Uh, the paperwork, the affidavits, you know, there's a law firm handling it and all this. And then, you know, it's, look, it, it is a settlement for people. It's not going to make anybody rich, but, it's, you know, it's something like, hey, here's what you went through. And then I'm getting questioned right now. And, you know, I'm like, I have to give more right now. And and I was kind of insulted by it a little bit. I was, and I asked a person who's dealing with the law firm and I, I was calm. I wasn't sitting there going crazy, but I was like, you know, is they seriously, I do this and like, what else they need? You know, I gave them everything they asked for. Um, and pause there for a second. I appreciate what they're doing because there's so many people that take advantage of that. Um, just a quick side note, I remember specifically within the first year of somebody who was touring around the country talking about their experience 
asking for money for, um, I remember reading this, and it got caught somewhere, I think it was in the Midwest, when someone finally caught up to them, that it, they were never there. It was a fraud. So I understand why they're doing it, but it be the person that has to now experience that, um, I'm a little upset by it, but I'll do what they ask of me. So it's kind of, you know, getting this together again. But, you know, outside of all this, it's not a constant, you know, how you're doing. Um, I know in the beginning, uh, just to bring this point up, survivors weren't really talked about. And it was a gentleman who helped me get everybody out. His name was John Pelletier. Uh, he has since passed. Um, he was an older gentleman, and uh, he was one of the uh, two gentlemen helping get people off the floor that day. He was in uh, on a, a committee because he was known up there, and they were talking about it. And he just stood up, and, you know, from Brooklyn, tough guy. He just said, what about the survivors? What are you doing about the survivors? No one's talking about them. And I thanked him for that. I was like, first, it took a lot of, you know what to say that, you know, wanted to offend people who had lost loved ones because he was in the room with people who lost loved ones. Um, and they, that's, I think that's where we start getting recognized um, from that point on. Um, so they, I think they're doing their best, but it's more tracking how you're doing. And this survey, I know what they're doing. They're seeing, is there any... Did you deter from last year? You know, are you having other issues? You're answering the questions differently. You know, mine have been pretty much the same. You know, I'm, I've been pretty much staying steady, but uh, you know, other people I've heard other how other people are are still having you know problems. You know, so and, and it's it's the reason I asked is because it's something that I'm always so curious about. And again, I've had a few friends who have <laughs> had mental health issues, a few friends who unfortunately have succumbed to it, and uh, I, I'm always a I'm always. Uh, uh, amazed at we're, we live in a world right now dude, where information and communication is abundant mm -hmm. but lack of communication is also abundant and yeah. ignorance about survivorship is 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 also uh ignorant and i'll tell you <clears throat> exploitation <clears throat> of tragedies is something that potentially <laughs> becomes very global has anyone tried to exploit you you know in in a way that Again, they're trying to monetize this this tragedy or exploit you, you know, as someone who unfortunately is maybe at, in an emotional weak state. In the very beginning, uh, I, you know, um, I was saying earlier before it started, uh, you know, after my name was out there, being from South Jersey, I told my wife at the time, be prepared for the onslaught. What's going to happen? You know, uh, her mother's husband called up one of the newspapers, hey, you know, there's a survivor here from that. And I, when I found that out, I go, and it was almost like on like on cue. Door started knocking. I was getting phone calls. Hey, can we come over, you know, do an interview with you? And there was one news station that the person wanted to sensationalize what happened and saying things that didn't happen. She wanted me to, you know, say, did this happen? And I said, I don't recall hearing that. Um, I, one was, she said, uh, yeah, I heard someone gave birth in, in the stairwell. And I looked at her, I go, I never heard that. You know, that would have been said, you know, that would, I've never heard that since then. And she's like, oh, okay. And then my kids were sleeping and she's like, can we go take a picture of them? They were taking a nap at the time. I said, well, they're kind of, and she talked me into it. I look back and I wish I would have had more, maybe I guess a backbone or something to say, no, you can't go up there. But I said, I guess so. And they went out with the cameras, taking pictures of my kids sleeping. Mm -hmm. I look back on shoot. That was the only new, every other news was very respectful, but that was the one to, they want to sensationalize something that, you know, oh, one part was where people fall in the stairwells because I say specifically when I when I got thrown in the wall by the impact, I kind of looked over my shoulder and people were grabbing the railing, keeping her balance. Nobody was really falling or anything like that. And she was just trying to build up the story and I wouldn't allow her to do that. And that was the only time it really happened. I mean, people have since then been very respectful of, you know, when, when I talk about it and. You know, it's, it's been good, so. I'm so thankful and grateful to have Lou here with us today. And I just want to make sure that the audience understands that this episode is being sponsored by Home Care Evolution. They've helped thousands of home care agency owners free themselves from day-to-day -day operations by maximizing efficiency within their organizations. Through education, training, and coaching, Home Care Evolution will help you find those in need of care and ultimately allow you to increase your senses, revenue, and profits Schedule a complimentary consultation today at Home Care Evolution. Scott and Steve will take care of you at homecareevolution.com. As I researched for this episode, uh, Lou, that's what I found out most. The, the, the massive exploitation, the massive fabrication, the massive sensationalism. And, and, and again, that worries me because it, it'll taint the legacy. Yeah. 
and it, it almost mocks survivors like you. So in order for us to nullify, you know, some of that exploitation and some of that skewed, you know, perception, I'm going to go through through the experience that day, you know, from a third party, somebody who wasn't there. And I want you to tell me um, what your reaction to that is. And again, I found out some things as I was researching this that I didn't know. Like, I didn't know that the South Tower where you were was hit second, mm -hmm. but collapsed first. Yes. And you went down from the 75th floor down to the uh, lobby. That was 150 floors you had to go down in pretty much 15 minutes. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. I mean, we started on the 87th floor. And oh. we took, we, um, yeah, we took an express elevator um, down to the 75th. Got it. And then when I walked out, that's when, you know, like, What's going on? That was the first time. I was like, it was just packed. We still didn't know what was, what was happening. And, and the, your first reaction was to help others escape. Uh, I know in one of your um, uh, interviews, your first reaction wasn't, let me just go. Let me you, you even knock coffee out of some people's yeah. hands and said, yo, wake up. Yeah, they were. Uh, I was about to get in the elevator and I saw the one guy helping me get everybody out. And he was down the hallway. I said, let's go, Bernie, let's go. And he's like, Luke, these people won't leave. So I got over his shoulder. And now I always say the World Trade Centers are a melting pot inside of a melting pot in New York City, inside of a melting pot in the United States. I mean, it was like all. Oh. So they were IT, they were foreign, and they just didn't understand what he was saying. So I pushed my ways, let's go, let's go. And I say, everybody understands international, the F-bomb. Everybody understands that word. And I pushed one guy in the back, and I took his coffee mug, and I threw it in the sink. And I kind of like, what's this guy crazy? And, he just, and I pushed him out, like, let's go and just to get him into the elevator. And, uh, you know, as I got there, I remember looking across the hall and seeing two women walking like nothing was happening. And that's, you know, I had at one point survivor's guilt um, because I always said to myself, what, what would happen if you were knocked on that door? Let's go, let's go. But I saw the phone off. There was a phone to call in. I thought maybe John called them because he knew everybody. And I found later 24 out of 25 was people were perished. And I only know that because I spoke to the, I met the woman by chance meeting she told me about it and i will never repeat anything like you know if you told three people and they told me story i will never repeat that story um but if someone tells you something firsthand i do include that and that's my perspective what could have been that day right so yeah hitting the elevators in the 75th floor from 87 that's when i came out i was like what is going on and i went to go to the first elevator and um it was packed and i'm a numbers guy and i remember on that wall saying no more than 3,500 pounds. I remember seeing that plaque. I'm like, well, don't go in there. You know, and one lady's pulling her arm in like this going, you can get in here. I said, nope, I'm going to take the stairwell. And, uh, you know, that's I remember looking out the window like this and seeing the Harbor and the Statue of Liberty, you know, which was amazing and not knowing that literally the plane was a couple miles in the horizon coming this way. And, uh, when I hit the stairwell, that's when it hit me. Like, although I was kind of weirded out by what was happening when the stairwell was packed, because I thought it'd be like one of maybe the only person going down there. That's when fear really took over my body. Like I couldn't, my, my legs were spaghetti. Like I couldn't, I was hanging on the railing and I was like, what is going on right now? And it's amazing because when I, when I read the story, as you helped others escape, as you helped others, not only physically escape, but, but emotionally be able to deal with the fear and also, also acknowledging that you are a young, scrappy, in good shape guy. You, you're still, you're still afraid. Yeah. You know, and, and, it, and it was for you, it was it was okay to be afraid because, again, our bodies have these protective mechanisms, fight or flight, that releases endorphins and adrenaline and it makes you go. Uh, but something that really uh, caught my attention was the, the, the survival st uh, story where you, you, get, you get to the lobby and you make it from World Trade Center to Penn Station. And I'm a New Yorker. I know that that's about 60 blocks, about three miles. It's a long walk. And it takes about an hour, right, to make that walk on a normal day. How long did that walk feel for you? <laughs> a long time. <laughs> it felt it was probably more than an hour because what was happening. First of all, I ran into somebody that led me that way because I I was at the base of Brooklyn Bridge before I started walking towards there, and I remember seeing thousands of people literally walking across the bridge. And I felt maybe go across there and go into Brooklyn and call from there because one, the cell phones weren't working. Um, I actually knocked on a restaurant door and offered twenty dollars to use the phone, and they just closed the door on me. And it was like they're like, no, 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 and I, and I get it. They were afraid. And I was like, wow. So, um, you know, and I, and I was in a bad part of town. And I always say the worst 
bad times bring out the worst in bad people. It really does. And I've heard a couple of stories firsthand was happened that day that it just it's unbelievable. And uh, so I, I told myself, I go, you look lost. You have a target on your back. And I go, do not be here at nightfall. So I saw this guy walking and I went up to him. I said, hey, excuse me, can you help me get to Penn Station? I figure because now I'm an expert in terrorism because I'm like, hey, they won't attack a train. So I'm like, let's go there. And um, so he just walked right by me. I was like, all right. So I went up to him again. I said, hey, can you help me get to Penn Station? He goes, yeah, left, right, blah, 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 and, and just walked away. And I'm like, man. So I kind of slumped my shoulders, slumped like this. And I'm like, oh. so I went up to him again. And he threw his arm. He was like, what? I went, whoa. I said, listen, I go, how do you get to Penn Station? He goes, oh. He goes, boom, 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 hit Broadway and just go up. And says, about four miles, something like that. I said, I have no idea where I'm at. He goes, well, I'm going. I want you to walk with me. And his name was John. And to this day, I regret not getting his last name mm. um, because I told him, I, I called him my North Star. I said, if it wasn't for you, I'd still be walking around somewhere down there. So um, we walked and every few blocks, because there were still reports of a plane being out there at that time. Mm. And so we would hear a plane, not knowing it was, I think it was a fighter jet at that time, but it was pretty high up. And everybody, if you just picture a whole street of dozens, probably hundreds of people, just all at once in unison stopping. And everybody would focus on the next biggest building in our sights because we thought they were coming at us again. And there would always be a car door open with people listening to the radio. It was like a movie set. And then we would stop trying to listen. Like, And they, I remember hearing him saying, yeah, one plane still on the count before. I'm like, man, this is crazy. And we walked and we finally got to Penn Station. We walked up there. I remember spe specifically them saying, all trains closed going to uh, Staten Island, Connecticut, and New Jersey. I'm like, are you kidding me, right? So I was going to wait. And then uh, we waited, you know, for them to open up. And we sat down. And, um, you know, uh, I, at that point, I was actually able to get hold of my wife at the time. And, uh, you know, I, my phone had died. And uh, I used John's. And I heard my... Uh, <sighs> My oldest son go uh just screams, Daddy. He's like I love you. I said, uh, I love you too, Louie. And uh so my wife goes, All right, I said, listen, you know, I got you know, how my sisters, you know, you can tell my sisters, she goes, Lou, they're all here waiting for you. I mean, that's how, that's they rallied. Um, they came from all parts of South Jersey. My one sister lived I mean, worked in Philadelphia, they shut that down. They were all waiting for me. And uh I said, I don't know when I'm going to be home. And then as we were sitting in there, just after a while, we saw this one guy walk up in scrubs. He had a mask on. And all of a sudden, he just started walking. And he just started spinning, looking in the air. And he was passing out. And we jumped up. And we just literally fell in our arms. And we're like, you know, so you're shaking. Are you okay? He's like, oh. He just jumped up. You what happened? I go, we know. We know. It's Hang with us, man. And we, we knew he just needed somebody. So we all three hung out together. And uh, until the trains opened up again, and I remember he went his separate way, but um, John and I um, stayed in line, and then uh, we ran. Well, first we walked, and I, which I don't do this, every train was packed, car was packed. I said, let's just wait. He goes, no, man, I'm going to get out of here. I go, you're right. And we just started running to the second last train was empty, sat down. I gave him a hug. I said, you're my North Star, man. He goes, no, I said, I would not be here right now. It wasn't for you. And after that, you think everything's fine, and it's big burly guy from Port Arthur just sits down facing the other way. We were in the seats where you face people in front of you. Fold his arms and goes, you guys got kids at home? Kind of look at John and said, yeah, I got two boys. And they're young. He goes, you better get rid of those clothes. He's not looking at it. No eye contact. He goes, there's asbestos in the air. And that's the first time I heard about it. He goes, you got one particle in your shirt. He goes, they breathe, they'll be in their lungs. They'll be there. He's just like, they'll be there forever. And he, but never looking at us. So to this day, I don't know when I got hold of my parents because they came to pick me up to bring a change of clothes. I don't know how that happened, wow. but they brought a change of clothes. And I always say, like, I had my favorite shirt on, literally my favorite shirt. I had to get rid of that. And I bagged everything, triple bagged, and threw it away when I had my, my dad went to Hamilton train station. So vivid what you're saying that I almost put – it puts you in the, in the scene. And, and, again, you're so, you're so detailed uh, with what happened. And – one thing that I wanted to mention to you is the, I, I know as you were fleeing successfully, thank God, uh, back to your family, um, you encounter a lot of people who didn't take this serious, right? So there was, there was some innocence 
as we mentioned, where some of you, some of your colleagues or some of the uh, people that you encountered even thought that, wow, we're going to go shopping for a little bit and then we'll come back up, you know, and do our thing. Yeah, that was in the stairwell. Like, I remember these women were like, just like talking. They were like several people in front of me like, ah, you know, just like the bombing in 93, you know, and I'm sitting there like, you know, at that time I was like, look, get a hold of yourself. And they're literally talking, "Ah, you know, we're going to take some time off. And I'm like, what the heck? Because our tower's fine. You know, they're, you know, we're, we're just walking down, you know, and, um, you know, until uh, we had we heard the one announcement say, stay in, you know, stay in, go to mezzanines, go to conference rooms, World Trade Center, one debris falling. And people get mad at that to this day. I don't blame them for saying that. Who, in our wildest dreams, you never think that another plane would be coming for us, right? So I don't blame them for saying that. Um, but we looked around each other because at that time I didn't know anybody. We said, now nah, we're going to keep on walking. And that's shortly after that when I heard the roar of the plane coming. I literally looked up, and that's the violent sound and just – you know, the impact was so violent, it threw me into a wall, you know. Wow. And so let's let's talk a little bit about how, who Lou is today. And one thing I, we mentioned this on, on several podcasts is I'm not interested in what people do. I'm interested in what makes people who they are. And so tell me a little bit about your, you know, aside from your kids, what are some of the things that make Lou happy? Uh, spending time with my wife, um, you know, literally just spending, I tell her, I go, I enjoy being with you. I embrace it. You know, and, uh, like we said, she's just an amazing person. Uh, she, you know, my family is to my son's lover, you know, my grandson hugs her, calls her GG. And I just, I sit back and I take it all in. Like she makes me the number one, you know, her and my kids are all equal, you know, like, and my grandson's now. She told me my granddaughter was going to put her second. I try to say no. She goes, oh, she's going to be wrapped around her finger. She, you're probably right, you know. But, uh, you know, as far as now for myself, you know, who I am today, um, since then, um, I'm a guy who will put himself out there more than I would ever have done before. And I'll give you an example. Literally last week, I'm in bed. It's 2 in the morning. I heard a girl screaming in the street. Oh, now, wow. probably before. I'm like, uh, whatever. And the third scream, I, I start putting clothes on. I go, I gotta see what this is. And my wife says, I said, I'll be right back. And I'm up the street and, you know, I saw an adult kind of come out from somewhere. And I was just kind of, I almost called 911, but I was watching, watching. They took her in. And I don't know what happened, you know, probably party, whatever. But, you know, just put myself out there. And, you know, one thing you'd ask, you know, what do you think, you know, since then your purpose is? You know, I met on one of the talk shows. Uh, I'm going to chop his name up, but Cardinal Belafalaka from uh, Philadelphia. And they, when he met me and knew who I was, he kind of took a step back. And he goes, son, God's got a plan for you. And I was like, you know, to, to have the man of the cloth that high up to kind of like take a step back from you as a normal person is pretty powerful, right? It's, it's overwhelming almost for that split second. And it's going to sound kind of a little bit crazy, but I really think at times um, I always encounter someone who elderly who needs help. And I'm, I've been there several times. It happens every several months. It could happen once a year. But one of the first times it happened, I came around the corner through Cherry Hill and this guy was on his back. He was big. He was bigger than me. And it was iced out, cold out. And I just pulled over. I was like, oh, are you okay? And his wife's yelling at him saying, I told him not to go out get the mail. Couldn't get him up. And I fly down the car and we got him up. And I'm like, okay, you know. Several months later, I'm in Morristown Mall. I go walking in. This woman came up, and right, I just knew something was wrong, and I stopped. She kind of, as we passed, she walked up to stop and kind of staring. I go, I just wonder, are you okay? I, I backtracked a couple steps, and she goes, ah, uh, yeah, my car. I just don't know where I parked my car. And I go, okay. And then I knew, for some reason in my head, I felt she had Alzheimer's. And as I said, I'm going to stay with her until as long as I can and get help. And all of a sudden, about a minute later, her husband came busting out the doors and he went to the right. And all of a sudden, yeah, to the right. And he looked over, he saw it was her, grabbed her arm, didn't say anything to me, and took her away. You know, and another time in Philly, blind guy, older guy, no one was helping him find the door to go to, uh, it was 18th to Market, a TD Bank. And I was coming across the street, and there he is. I said, sir, you need help? He goes, ah, oh, just need the door, son. Just need the door. And once there, I'll be good. And I just find myself in those situations. I'm like, and I feel that's part of it sometimes. And, you know, and then, yeah. <laughs> and my boys, of course. So It's it's, it's awesome because I, as I'm listening <laughs> to you, you know, we talked about the purpose, and we talked about, you know, God's plan, and we talked. You, you mentioned the North Star 
of the gentleman who helped you guide you through Penn Station, you basically just uh, relayed a, a, a tremendous amount of insight of you being others North Star. No, I never you, thought about you that. You being <laughs> their guidance. And the reason I talked about innocence and, and innocence being lost, Lou, is because when innocence is lost, we take our blinders off. We, we become more intuitive. Um, there's more awareness of our surroundings. Uh-huh. And New York and Americans have always been known as it's an eat dog, eat dog world. Yep. And, and nobody cares about about other people. But I think you, you've shown, you know, at least in this podcast, but I'm sure in your life, that there's a tremendous amount of camaraderie and solidarity that a human mind still possesses. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, sometimes we tend to forget about that, that we're more united and we're more, you know, helpful of one another um, than I think sometimes is, is, is exhibited in the mainstream, right? Because the mainstream still says that, you know, we're, we're very venomous and we're all about ourselves and, you know, we're very selfish. But again, you've shown that actually um, you're a very selfless person. So I, I, want, I want you to tell me from a perspective of life, family, and community, what, what is something from 9-11 that you experienced either that day or since that you would like to share with others? What's important for you as we talk about you being that North Star, as we talk about you being that intuitive person that is potentially being a beacon of light and insight for your children, for your wife, for others, who strangers, what are some of the things that you want to use this platform to tell people uh, that you would like for them to know that it's something that they should be aware of, that unfortunately sometimes that lack of uh, innocence which or that abundance of innocence which is ignorance we tend not to see uh you know it's easier said than done but being there for others you know um you know one thing i got to mention uh when i worked in philadelphia afterwards you know how many homeless people do you pass every day and just walk by them you walk around them you walk over them and i just had this one idea one day i want you to bring a backpack just put things in there like oranges wood or something they would need and I did this thing for a couple of years called Backpacks for the Homeless. Just out of my house, I just got collected backpacks. I put it on Facebook. And it was the response was overwhelming, and um, I would pack them with clothes, make sandwiches, put water in there, and I would put them back in my car. And I would just go around Philadelphia, and I went down to South Jersey or Atlantic City, and just give them out to the homeless. Wow! And this, yeah, and and uh, one time uh, I brought my son with me because I wanted him to see. It was my youngest. He was in his mid teens to see what. You know, appreciate what you have. That's another thing. They appreciate what you have. And I made him give the bag to this one kid. He looked normal. And I had given the bag to a couple, two bags. And he goes, hey, can I have one of them? I looked at him and go, you're homeless? He goes, yeah, I've been homeless. I have nowhere to go. And I made my son give him the bag. I said, give him that bag. And when we walked away, I said, look at that kid. He's your age. And one of the last guys went up to him, he goes, <clears throat> the guy goes, no one stops. No one stops and talks to us. No one ask anything of us he goes and he thanked me for you know i said i hope this helps a little bit you know but uh it's putting yourself out there when others need you um just trying to be um you know for my family uh you know my sisters we we've, we've been through a rough time lost my mom in oh Oh, uh, oh, five, and then lost my sister 10 years a day in 015 mm. with the cancer. And then we lost our dad um, in uh, 020 uh, right before uh, Thanksgiving. Um, so it was kind of those pillars. They were all the elder. They were kind of gone. It's like me and my four sisters. So, you know, at times trying to be the strength, you know, keep together. It's been rough. Um, got a lot of nieces and nephews. And, uh, Uh, sorry about that. Um, you know, I sent them a uh, a text. I always send it to my sons and, you know, my sisters, but I never say anything to my nieces and nephews. And I sent them all a text and group text and just told them that, you know, I appreciate them, I love them, and that, uh, you know, I'm glad I'm still here to watch them go through life as they choose to. Uh, I don't know exact words, but... Uh, 
you know, I wanted to let him know that their Uncle Louie loves them. So, you know, full circle <laughs> to your question. Sorry, sometimes I go tangents. Uh, That's okay. You know, about how you are afterwards and what I learned from there is, you know, get out of your lane sometimes. You know, sometimes you have to, whether it's force, and the results will surprise you. You know, they will surprise you. And, uh, yeah, people will notice it more than you think. And I was, I, I was a proponent of, like, you know, no one's ever going to notice this. You know, whatever. Why even do it? And now I don't care about that. Like, if I do so, I don't care if anybody thanks me or not. I'm just doing it for myself being, you know, for my family or, or to help that person needs maybe a, a, a glass of water because they're on the street and they need that. Um, I don't care if anybody sees it or not. I just know I did it for myself, and it made them feel good at that point. So that's what I learned since 9-11. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. And, and again, it's it's a it's a beautiful thing to see. Thank you. You um, t- describe it, and and again, I, 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 I emotionally, emotionally, um, I can tell that you have so much love. You have so much love, but the the, the power of love, I think, is is very, very, very. Um, it, it's something that it illuminates uh, a room, and it's something that exudes uh, out of you. Uh, also, the power of gratitude. I can tell that. I can tell that you're very grateful for where you are right now, and and I think uh, despite a lot of the setbacks, it's 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 easy sometimes to be dejected, right? It's sometimes easy to to uh, almost feel like you know why why is the man upstairs dealing such a card such cards for you? And again, there's a tremendous amount of humility here. But I got to tell you, Lou, just hearing you talk the past you know, 40, 45 minutes or so, the world needs you, bud. The world <laughs> needs you. You know, and I think I think in 9-11, you know, um, <laughs> there was something behind you, you know, uh, that was carrying you down those steps, you know, as your legs felt like spaghetti, it was carrying you down those steps, and it, and, it, and it almost carried you away from the World Trade Center, into that train, into your kid's arms as you got home, because the world needs you. The world needs more people like you. And, and and hearing your message, hearing your story, hearing the unbelievable, genuine aspect of your story, uh, which is, again, uh, to me personally, extremely motivated. Um, again, I give you a, a ton of credit for that. You know, I, I think right now they are, since the years of, since the years of, of 9-11, how have you seen the world change well, you know, you hear a lot immediately afterwards, you know, a store couldn't keep a flag in, you know, on their shelves, right? Everybody's waiting to flag. People willing to help each other for those several weeks, months afterwards, even the day of, you know, um, when I give my talks and to talk about my experience. But, you know, I talk about how people came together. You know, um, there's 500,000 plus people on the shoreline of Manhattan. That's when you realize it was an island, you know, and there was... I think one or two Coast Guard boats put up Mayday because we can't get these people off there. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it's called a uh, 9-11 boat rescue. People still don't know about that. you know. And, and I urge people to always go on YouTube, look it up. It's a 13-minute thing. It's incredible to hear how we, as a nation, came together. You know, the survivor tree guy takes this tree, the last living thing. And I watched him talk. He said, if I never do anything, if I, he goes, if I die tomorrow and I do anything else, this is the one thing I feel, you know, and the tree uprooted twice, should die twice. It still lived. Right. Awesome. And it's in the memorial site. So that, that's amazing. And then, um, you know, you're helping, but as you know, it starts dissipating. Right. And then we get to now where we are today. You see like in the news and we, we look, it's no secret. We're divided as a country. It's, it's pretty bad right now. But what I see a lot too, is these, and it's from a younger generation, which is really refreshing, is I seen um, about a couple weeks ago, it was a softball game, and the girl turned first base, and she hit a home run, and she did something to her, like a freak injury, and she went to the ground. She couldn't get up. Two girls from the other team picked her up and walked around the bases. I saw that. Right? Okay, I that. good. I cried. I, I just thought that stuff gets to me. That is amazing, Right. Um, and I see more of that um, kids helping kids. And there was another one where kids struck out his best friend to win the championship just about a year ago. And as his team celebrated, he went up to his friend and hugged him. You know, that that's what we need more of, you know. And hopefully we – I don't think we'll ever get back to where we were just months afterwards. But 
get even a percentage of that would make us a better country, you know, just to be there for each other when we need it the most, you know, and just stop being so divided. It's, it's tough. You know, I see it on Facebook. I see, you know, people jawing each other at times, people saying I had to block him because he yelled at me for this and that because of our differences in, you know, political opinions and whatnot. And I just sit back and read stuff like that. And look, I've been to heated discussions, but afterwards I'm like, hey, let's go grab a beer. You know, I'm not gonna let it run our lives. You know, like you're allowed to disagree. You're allowed to be passionate about your beliefs, right? You can be. Uh, but I think people get to the point where they just stop there and they don't want to hear other people. That That's where we need to change. And this is one of the major reasons <clears throat> why we started the podcast. We wanted to make sure that we resonated with listeners and everybody out there that, you know, the power of love and the power of gratitude is stronger than any energy out there right now. And the division that we're seeing in the world today, the political sensationalism, the political divide, all that to me is temporary. It's temporary. Yeah, because I, I guarantee so. you one thing, the power of gratitude and power of love will overcome all those things. And I'm, 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 to me, I, I share your sentiments, but I don't think they're permanent. I truly believe as a parent of three kids, a teenager and two soon-to-be teenagers, that the best is yet to come for us. And you're an example of that. You're an example of the fact that the human spirit is so resilient that I don't care what we go through. Right, it only makes us stronger, you know. And I think we're we're going through a patch, a patch that we're going to look back, just like you look back at 9/11 as a transformative experience that made you better. I think the last four, five, six years, we're going to look back and see this as a transformative period that made our world and our country better. That would be. I awesome. strongly believe in that, and I will never, ever, ever, ever um, change my mind about that. I'm staunch about that. I want to hear from. Who you look up to, role models? Who's someone who motivates you, famous and not? Um, well, you know, although she's no longer here, is my mom. Um, my mom was four foot eleven, although she says five foot. I always tease her about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wonderful pillar of calmness, you know. And she was the first person I talked to that day. I got her on the phone just by my phone was ringing. I was like, oh, my God, it's mom. You know, and she's like, are you okay? And I always say, if it was one of my sisters, they had me in traction hospital, you know, whatever. But she was like, I got your dad on the phone. But she just her calmness, you know. And uh, she was the first person I saw that day. Um, you know, coming out of Hamilton train station, if has been there, it, you come out, I always go to the left, 100 out of 100 times. That day I got cut off, got frustrated, went to the right came down and there's my mom standing there and I said, Hey, old lady, you looking for me? She turned around, just put her hands out, picked me up and, uh, just literally my feet left the ground and just it was wonderful. And you had asked something before and I, when it was a time that kind of stepped back about God and you know, what led me away from there is that for the longest time, people asked me in the stairwell, you know, I, you know, I said, I got thrown in the wall a second time because people started panicking. Right. And, I just started pushing people off saying we got to stay calm and you know i was kind of yelling it but it was controlled and i remember a guy you can see his head he was yelling the same thing and um when i was going to therapy uh i asked a person about that and she goes well people listen to a calm person more than anybody and i tell and when i give my talks to kids too i say you know like would you listen to someone jumping up screaming no you listen to that calm person and all that so several years ago when i was actually with my wife we were just dating at the time we watched a movie called Breakthrough, and uh, it's when a kid fell through the ice. He was clinically mm. gone for 20 minutes. Yes. And the actress, uh, the woman from This Is Us, was the mother. And when she went in, heard that powerful scene, uh, screaming and crying, praying. And he came back to life, right? And as I'm watching this, I felt my, I just started crying. And all of, for now, I was sobbing uncontrollably. And my wife, well, my girlfriend at the time, she looked at me. She, I go, I just put my hand up. I go, just. And when I finally calmed down and I said, I know why I got out of there. I know why I stayed calm. It was my mom praying. In my heart, uh, she was praying for me and she gave me strength to stay calm. We talked about earlier before this gentleman who wanted to jump over the stairwell, you know, I 
grabbed his shoulder, told him, no, can't do this. You know, I'm afraid just like you, you know, looking back at myself, I was never that type of person to do something like that, but just, I reacted and it was her, you know? So, uh, to what your statement, you know, Lee now there it was her just, you know, guiding me. The power of prayer. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is incredible. And I think the power yeah. of prayer from a family member who, again, is, is, is founded on unconditional love like our parents. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's a famous saying that goes, and I believe in this saying wholeheartedly, is no one will ever love you as much as your mother. And um, I truly believe that. Yeah. She, uh, you know, um, and, you know, now, even honestly, the three people in my life that are important, my boys and my wife, I look up to them. Um, my wife, she's old. She's younger than me. Um, eight years younger than me. She always makes fun of me about her age. And, uh, but <laughs> so she's it's mine. You know, so it's mine. She goes, you know, when you're 18, I was like, don't say that. You know, like, <laughs> don't say that. Always, but uh, she's old school. Um, first time she was at my house, I had, I always ate at my, you know, coffee table. I had all this, you know, my plate had all like whatever on it to trash from the uh, eating and napkins. She comes in and takes it. I go, you don't have to do that. Since then, she's been that same person. Do you need anything? You're good. I got your tea. Every morning I wake up, there's fruit for me. And it just, I watch her and amazing. And my boys, you know, um, you know, uh, man, where they're going in life. You know, um, th they're following their dreams. And honestly, uh, you know, I had a couple of regrets. You know, I should, you know, someone asked me to be a teacher when I was younger. And I said, nah, yeah, I went to college. I just got to go into the business world, right? You know, that's what you're supposed to do. And it was my uh, athletic director. I coached right out of high school, cross country and track. He said, she should be a teacher, really good with kids. And I never did it. And that's a regret. But I look at my son as doing what they want to do now. And they're you know, kind of my heroes because they're, you know, they're going and they're happy. And I, and I watch them. It's like, so, you know, there's three people now I look up to. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. And what's next for Lou Giacardo? Well, I said I got a granddaughter coming in December. Um, family's getting bigger. But uh, for me is, uh, you know, I think about retirement. You know, what I want to do, how I'm going to go through the next several years of my life. It's honestly just taking a day at a time, taking a week at a time, um, not trying to get wrapped up in things, uh, just try and live my life to the best I can, you know, and just keep the message going. Don't waver for what I've been doing over the last 22 years. Speak what a man spoke about 9-11 because I, I, I see, and like I said earlier, why I do it, and it does help people. Um, but just, uh, you know, I, I just go through my life and just, you know, just be happy. And when I, you know, I, I tell my friends, like, guys, we're hitting 60 soon, right? You know, a couple of years, you know, we're in the last quarter of our life. It's crazy. And, you know, like, am I just when, you know, people look back and my family say, you know, he was a good person. Life is a beautiful thing. Yeah. Lou, and, and, and when you live it well, it's even better. And I always say, you know, people say all the time, life is short. And yes, for some of us, it's shorter than others. But when you live it well, it's long enough. And it seems like you're living your life well. It seems like 9-11 taught you more about life that day than I think ever before, you know, before uh, that day. And, it, and it's incredible to see. I, I felt, I feel like I, I'm sitting next to someone who, who just taught me a ton. Wow. Just taught me a ton. <laughs> uh, the, the human spirit, you know, someone who's validated the fact that there are still a, a tremendous amount of great people out there. You know, and, and, and this week when we celebrate the tragedy, I want to celebrate the success that came out of that. The success that came out of there and people like yourself, the success that came out, your, you know, your two children, you know, their children, your wife. And this is the, what, for me, 22 years later, 9-11 means is let's talk about the good stories that have, you know, come out of that. And I, I, unfortunately, you know, all you see is, again, that's the old adage that goes, if it bleeds, it leads, right, in the mainstream. I, I, I want to change that. I want to change that again into the power of gratitude, the power of love, the power of the human spirit being one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful aspect in the world. And if we are able to use it and leverage it and channel it well, my goodness, we're going to get out of where we are right now in the world. 
And as we conclude this incredible conversation with our guest, Lou, a 9-11 survivor, a hero, I want to leave you all with this question to ponder. In the face of unmanageable adversity, how does the human spirit not just survive but thrive? Take a moment to reflect on the resilience and strength we've witnessed today. Remember that even in the darkest moments, there's a spark of hope, a wellspring of courage, and a testament to the enduring power of the human heart. Thank you, Lou, for taking us on your journey. And always remember that we have the capacity to rise above no matter the challenges that confront us. And thank you, we are changing the habits of yesterday by creating the new healthcare reality of tomorrow.